Escape with us now to the windswept peak of Ferndale. And the story of a man who sacrificed everything to climb it. As M.L. Elric tells it in his gripping story, Conquest. Get your finger out of my face. Get your finger out of my face. Take the first shot, then if you want to get your finger out of my face. It's gone. What are you doing? What are you doing? That is not painful by them. That is painful by the people of Detroit. Let me tell you something. You want to go right now? Okay? You want to go right now, Elric? It's your old pal ML Elric of Fox 2 News checking in. Uh, Just a quick program note to start the show. We last week talked about the art of surveillance and the art of the stakeout and getting our man. We did get our man, and that story is airing on Fox 2. We will have the link to that on our website, uh, mlsoulofdetroit.com, where you'll see it in the story notes. Of course, you can find that story and all the stories we do at fox2detroit.com. I wanted to get into that this week, but you know what? I am going to put that on hold because Jeffrey Epstein, oh boy, his unexpected death, I guess unexpected by nobody because he tried to kill himself before, has ginned up a bunch of conspiracies. And conspiracies are a pet peeve of mine. I have spent more time in my career investigating the Manoogian Mansion Party rumor than any other story I've ever looked into. We're going to get into that. Uh, We're going to talk about some other legendary Detroit conspiracies, some of which turned out to be true, some of which were all a bunch of bunk. And and just in general, I, I gotta I gotta throw this out here. When it comes to media conspiracies, let me just tell you about media conspiracies. If you knew how every single thing produced by the media came so close to not being produced, including this show. Because we can barely get our pants on, let alone conspire with other people and get everybody on the same page. You would laugh at every conspiracy out there. And so I'm bringing in my co-conspirator, Mark Fellhauer, the, uh, the uh, co-host of uh, ML Soul of Detroit, co-host of the Drew and Mike podcast, the executive producer of the Charlotte and Dad podcast. Yeah, you met the other talent the other day. She was not impressed with you. Um, well, you know, I didn't think she was that great a kitty. Oh, I mean, um, she was a charming, um, oh, yeah, young, right. really outgoing and young, um, um, young princess. And, uh, I see only, uh, bright things ahead for her in her. whatever institution she is sentenced to, <laughs> but, um, that's no reflection on, on her parents, I'm sure. Um, and Sean Windsor, speaking of Enfance de Rible, will be joining us later on what I trust will be the worst phone ever produced. <laughs> oh, it always is. Including this bag phone that my dad had 30 years ago when my grandma had Alzheimer's. And speaking of Alzheimer's, Sean will be using the same uh, logic that uh, Grandma Elric did um, in her final days. Uh, God bless Grandma Elric. God rest her soul. Sean, you're on your own. So um, before we get into all that, we've got we to talk about the guy who makes all this possible. And that's, that's David Hall of Hall Financial. He is, as you know, a Red Shovel Network sponsor. And he's a guy, as I said, who makes this possible. We don't like to work for free. I'm a union guy. We're going to talk about that in Geek of the Week. I need to be paid for my time. This show takes money to produce. Mark's time is worth something. Sean, eh. But anyway, um, David Hall is the guy who makes that possible. He's taking a chance on this form of media, and we want you to take a chance on him. But it's not really a chance because it always seems to work out. If you're trying to refinance your home, Hall Financial would love to save you money. Uh, by the way, you may have noticed that like 15-year interest rates are down to 3%. You think it's going to get any lower? I don't think Th- so. 30 years are down, too. Yeah. They're all way down right now. This Refis is the are time. way up, so get off your ass and call yeah. Hall. Even if you have a sweet interest rate, do it. I, 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 got, I got just under hey. four, and I'm thinking of refinancing myself. I did that with Dan Morrison and Shannon. They really helped me out. They'd appreciate a call. You can reach them through David at dhall at hallfg.com. Or call Hall Financial at 248-308-5000. They have over 755 star reviews. This show has over 200 hey. five star reviews. We'd like to get up to David Hall land. They'll do it fast, too, by the way. Industry average for refi is 44 days. They're hitting 19 days. They'll fight for you even if you have a little blemish on that old credit record. Email dhall at hallfg.com. Call 248-308-5000. And if you really want to help us... Help them, help you, help us. Think about it. Play it back. Okay. It makes sense. Okay. 
Tell them that ML sent you and thank them for giving the soul of Detroit a chance to stick around for a little while longer. NMLS 1467435, whatever that means. So, Mark. Great guy. Manugan Mansion party, did it happen? Um, well, that's, that's kind of an open-ended question. You were there. Well, let's start with this. You were the tiny dancer dancing for money. I saw, the, I saw that. And the old uh, musical do. I broke the table leg off. Oh, damn. Um, let me ask you this. Were there ever parties at the Manoogian Mansion? Yes. The neighbors say that there were parties, regular parties, at the mansion in the neighborhood. People making noise, people carrying on. But all the neighbors we could reach, which is all of the neighbors except for one house. Well, those people were never home right next door. Say the Manoogian Mansion party. Did not happen, and some of them wished that it had happened because they did not like the mayor, and they realized, the mayor, of course, being Kwame Kilpatrick, that if they could have blown him out by confirming the party, they would have. They would have. Yeah. Well, and so that's why I asked it, because you're referring to the party, the one that, uh, you know, there was an investigation by the attorney general into it, because the story is a dancer, Strawberry, was there. Carlita found out about this, broke a leg off a table, hit her with it, and then the grander conspiracy is then Kilpatrick, Kwame, had her murdered, Strawberry. Or, or covered up her killing. And, and this, this rumor, which uh, Jim Schaefer and I spent many, 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 many days and years investigating at the Detroit Free Press, is one of the most virulent rumors in Detroit history. There's some other rumors out there. Mm-hmm. Former Detroit Police Chief uh, Chief Hart was busted for uh, basically stealing money, some of which he had stashed up in the ceiling of his house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after he was busted and the money was seized, a rumor that went around to the chagrin of the people who bought the house was that there's still money up there. Yeah. So well, that you know that's kind of similar to another Kilpatrick rumor that there's money hidden by him or Ferguson. Oh, I don't think buried. that's a rumor. I think that's a fact. Okay. The question is where, where is the money? Is it? So there was a rumor that Mayor Coleman Young had a love child. Uh, uh, there was a rumor that went around uh, that Mayor Denner, Dennis Archer had a baby with a woman in Windsor, uh, or with a woman, and they hid the kid in Windsor. Uh, when Kwame Kilpatrick was running for mayor, there was a rumor that he had committed rape while he was a football player at Florida A&M University. And then Sharon McPhail herself spread the rumor that Kwame Kilpatrick tried to have her electrocuted <laughs> right. and by the, a cushion on her chair. And then Sharon McPhail worked for him. denied <laughs> that, that it ever happened, that she had ever said it, even though we all have video of that. So of those five rumors, two of them are true. Okay, now, to me, rumors and conspiracy theories are different. Conspiracy theories are full-blown, where you need a bunch of actors working together to achieve something, which is why... I loathe them more than anything because nobody ever works together that perfectly. Uh, you talked about media conspiracy theories, government conspiracy. When does the government ever work together to get something done perfectly where nothing leaks? Well, the beautiful thing about government conspiracies are these guys can't get their job done. Exactly. You think they could get, I mean. Maybe if, because they're focused on these grand conspiracies. Oh, that's right. They're, they're just, Keeping so, that hidden. I have to set the record straight on the which two rumors are true. Mm, mm-hmm. Uh, Coleman Young did have did, a baby. Yeah. Joel Loving. Joel Loving. And uh okay, Coleman Young the th- is he the third or the second? He's the second. Second. And uh and Sharon McPhail did say she was electrocuted, even though it isn't true that Kwame tried to electrocute. So I guess that's one and a half of those five <laughs> legendary Detroit rumors but are true. Dennis Archer did not have a love child. If he did, we never found it. Oh, he's in Windsor. Or she's in Windsor. In sh- is Sean Child. Windsor and her. Oh, that's what I'm concerned It's another conspiracy theory that'll blow up. But the biggest one of all time in this city is the Manoogian Mansion party with Strawberry. Right. And you had to chase it down. And how quick did you put the pieces together that this did not happen? So there's a thing called the Ring of Truth. And the thing about the Ring of Truth is real things have a way that you can recognize that's discernible. So... If somebody says that, uh, you know, hip-hop mayor has party at Manoogian Mansion, that's plausible. But for to have the ring of truth, the people talking about it have got to be people who would know about it. So who would know about a party like that? First of all, you'd have the mayor. You'd have the guests. You'd probably have the neighbors. You'd have uh, any of the performers at the party. You might have, um, you might have police who were in the area providing security or maybe telling people to stay away from the house because 
there was a party. And we did prove that the mayor did use his police bodyguards to escort Queen Latifah to a motorcycle club and then told police in the precinct to steer clear of that neighborhood so that they wouldn't interrupt the party or, or ruin Queen Latifah's good time. What? Yeah, sorry, that, that's... Queen Latifah came to Detroit to go to a motorcycle club? Queen Latifah was in Detroit. I'm so confused. Why? She was hanging out with Kilpatrick and his crew because he was a hip-hop mayor. She yeah. was you know, the queen of hip-hop. So far, that, that makes forever. sense, I guess. And so um, either she wanted to go to a biker club or the mayor thought she might want to go to a biker club. And so one of his most trusted bodyguards escorted her to a biker club on the west side. And the word went out to all the cops on duty that night, stay away from this club because we don't want anything to disrupt the Queen's good time. Now, see, they couldn't keep that a secret because someone let it out. Exactly, because the people involved, there are too many people involved. The minute you tell one other person something, it's not a secret, and the secret will never be kept. So so, so with the Manoogie Mansion Party, where do you start with the rumor? Do you start so, at the top for a quote, or do you start with the neighbors? Um, no, so we don't. We don't. Now, there were reporters who, who sort of did door knocks and, and surveyed the neighbors about this. I went the other way. I have police sources, and so I contacted cops who should have known about this and said, hey, did you hear anything about this? They said... No. And I said, who would know about it? They gave me some other names. I talked to them. They didn't know either. Now, here's where the ring of truth kicks in. So right now you're like, okay, this is not checking out. These people should know about it. This should have been talked about because nobody, no grapevine is more robust than police and fire grapevines. These guys spent a lot of time together. These, guys, these men and women spent a lot of time together. They spent a lot of time talking about things. They're interested in what goes on. They're the eyes and ears. They see the things that we never see. If they don't know anything about it, to me, it's over. Done deal. Hell yeah. But what ended up happening was, after a couple weeks, I started getting calls from these same people who I called to ask about this, and they'd say, Hey, did you hear about the party at the Manoogian Mansion? And I said, <laughs> Yeah, I talked about uh, it last week. Yeah, I told you about it. And they're like, No, 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 no. I heard it, you know, I, you're blah, blah, blah. And I said, No, no, no. I told you about it. And when I told you about it, you said you didn't know about it. I was like, Oh, no, you didn't. I know all about it. And that's when you start to say, This ain't true. Why? Because it just boomerangs back. The rumor mill just right. gets so it's, moving. So it's, it's called backfeeding. So what ends up happening is you put something out there. And it comes, yeah. And then people start spreading it. Or maybe they well intentioned ask people about it. Like, well, I should know about it, but I don't. But maybe so and so is on duty. I'll ask him. Now all of a sudden, what happens is everybody's talking about it. And because everybody's talking about it, people figure, oh, so it must be true. And if it must be true, then it really happened. But they don't ever go to that part where, where's your witnesses? You can't yeah. make a case without witnesses. But it's what ends up happening is people wanted to believe it so badly that they just said it happened. Now, as you heard from more and more people as it kept coming back up, did it get more sensationalized? Did they add pieces to it like a big old game of telephone? Yes. Um, so... That's where there's a, there's a Michael Crichton book called The Andromeda Strain, and it's about this, this virus that comes down, this bug, and it's going to wipe out all of humanity because as soon as they figure out how to cure it it, 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 it morphs. It turns into something else. So then they're chasing it, trying to figure out how to cure that, and they figure that if this thing keeps changing, they'll never keep up with it, and geometrically everybody will be dead because it'll just keep changing and they'll never come up with a cure. The way the book ends, spoiler alert, if I recall correctly, <laughs> damn it, that it changes into a benign thing, and then so humanity is saved. Oh, okay. So not one of the more interesting Michael Crichton books, no, but, but it's an interesting pretty uh, easy way to end a book, in my opinion. But yeah, it's uh, it's the it's crazy. Uh, what do they call that? The uh, then again, he's a more successful writer. Machinus ex Deus, where you have this hand of God thing that makes everything make sense in a, a magical oh, way. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. But anyway, b- back to back to the Manuga Mansion rumor. What ends up happening with bullshit is that once you pin everything down, then it changes. So at first it was the first lady came to um, the Manoogian mansion and uh, pistol whipped uh, the stripper. Okay, well then uh, she doesn't have a gun, so then it changed to uh, table leg. Then it changed to... Which seems ridiculous, by the way, that 
yeah. that would break one off or one would be broken off perfectly enough. It's just yeah, the details never make sense in a conspiracy theory. But, you know, people do get details wrong. The, the, the key point is that she beat somebody with down something. on the front yeah. lawn. So, okay, so we'll stick with that, whatever the implement was. So then the stripper's beaten. Well, uh, then it becomes that, um, um, uh, well, why, why didn't she go to the hospital? Well, because uh, a, a female cop who worked for the chief of police um, used her insurance card to get the stripper cared for. That's why the stripper never went public, because she was, she was looked after and whatever. Uh, the, the crazy thing is the chief of police did have a woman who worked for him who used to be a stripper, which she kind of confirmed for us. But that's a tale for another time. Nice. But then what ends up happening is Strawberry is killed. So now Strawberry gets sucked into this vortex where, oh, the, we know who the stripper is now. It's, it's Strawberry. Oh, because she just happened to be the one who was murdered? Right. Now, right. This is, this so is so where... now people are like, why would the mayor, and this is one of my theories, does Kwame Kilpatrick ever do anything halfway? Why would he have a party with just one stripper? Yeah, where are the other ones? So not long after that, uh, a rumor comes out, well, the other stripper went to Atlanta, and she was murdered. So they got to her. <laughs> now, on. Scott Lewis, my predecessor as investigator yeah, reporter at Fox 2, investigated and found there was no stripper murdered in Atlanta. So what ends up happening is this thing takes on all sorts of elements that once you eliminate one key element, then it, it morphs. In the conspiracy theory, what was the reason for murdering her? Because they assumed that she would sue the first family for assault. I mean, there right, has to be a re- I mean, it's... She it could sounds like a fun little story, but first what? family. Oh, but come because on. They'd want to keep Carlita out of prison. So they're that far ahead of the game that because she could do it, that we have to have her murdered or cover up the murder. Yeah. Well, at, first it, at first it was just get her make healed. Any sense. And then once there were no hospital records, it's like, well, they didn't take it. They had her, you know, they had her. So yeah. at what point in the story did it get far enough for there to be a, an investigation done by the state? And did you think that was appropriate for the state to even do the investigation? Sure. So, of course, um, Gary Brown, who was the head of internal affairs at the Detroit Police Department, um, heard from one of, uh, one of the mayor's bodyguards reported some wrongdoing by members of the mayor's security team, which were, in fact, proven. Yeah. And uh, most of them. Um, and, and reported this to internal affairs. As part of his, of his report to the internal affairs department, he said... This officer did this, this officer did that. And by the way, there's a rumor that the mayor had a crazy-ass party at the Manoogian Mansion. And so even the tipster, the source of this, uh, this information... Called it a rumor? ...said, yeah, I don't know if this is true or not, but by the way, while I'm talking to you, people are talking about this, so, you know, whatever. Gary Brown was investigating, had just started to investigate the more legitimate, the more um, solid allegations, and it mentioned in a memo, and by the way, there's, you know, there's a, uh, there's a rumor that uh, there was a party at the Manoogian Mansion which the First Lady was involved, and one of the people investigating it had written, you know, both of what the rumor was and then had added some, some comments like, uh, of course, if this were to be proven to be true, it could be devastating to the First Lady and so on and so forth. So this memo makes its way to Christine Beatty, the mayor's chief of oh. staff, and love her. Yeah. And so then Gary Brown is gone. So now we've been investigating this rumor for, for months. Uh, Jim and I have been – we've talked to more strippers, to more dancers, to more – uh, EMS people, um, it was pretty crazy. At one point, we had talked to so many people that uh, we were talking to agents for strippers. Strippers have agents. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we were trying to track down rumors like the the women who danced, because at, at one time it was multiple women who danced before it was Strawberry. And we were told it was members of the Mercedes ladies. And then we were told the dancers' names were uh, Mo Money, Electric, and Pleasure Girl. Huh. And so we're, we're calling stripper agents saying, uh, hi, I'm calling from uh, the Detroit Free Press. Uh, just wondering, uh, do you repre represent uh, Mo Money, Electric, or Pleasure Girl? 
Um, what? No, huh? <laughs> Nobody knew who these strippers were, including uh, one of my partners at the Free Press at the time, who was well acquainted with um, dancers at uh, primarily black strip clubs. And his, uh, his assessment when I told him what the names of the strippers were, he said, those names are whack. <laughs> so we looked into this stuff, and uh, nobody, no one, none of it checked out. But once, once Christine Beatty, and we didn't report on any of it, uh, once Christine Beatty and the mayor fired Well, there's uh, nothing to really Brown, report on. I mean, you don't report on... What we don't find. A rumor. Right. Oh, so, so okay. Unless it's so big, I suppose. That so, it, digression time. Yeah. All you guys out there is like, why don't you report on, on Doug and this? Why don't you report on so-and-so that? Why don't you report on this program being corrupt? Um, don't assume, because I haven't reported on it, that I haven't looked into it. What you can assume is that if I looked into it and it turned out not to be true or there was no evidence, we didn't report it. So if you haven't seen me for a while, maybe that's what I've been doing. I don't want to tell you what I've been doing because we kind of work stealthily. Now, the one thing about about investigating a rumor is it's like looking up a word in the dictionary where you're looking up a word that you're really interested in, but you find a bunch of words along the way that are way more interested. And for you kids out there who don't know what a dictionary is, it's like a phone book. <laughs> it's a large published a web, volume that includes website. information. I guess the analogy would be for you millennials, it's like going on YouTube and seeing a bunch of videos and then not being able to stop. And I do the same thing. So, so it's just dictionary.com. It's better to look things up, and I'm going to tell you why right now, is because the words you look up on your way to find the word you're interesting, interested in and you learn way more by doing it that way. It's like why you pick up a hard copy of the newspaper instead of looking at it online. When you turn the pages, you see stuff you dig. Yeah. So, so in the course of investigating this, we didn't prove that the Manugian Mansion Party happened, but we did prove that the mayor's bodyguards had inordinate amounts of overtime. We did prove that the mayor had an extraordinarily large security detail compared to other mayors of big cities around the country. We did show that the mayor's bodyguards had crashed some cars that the city had fixed up on the quiet, and we proved all kinds of other things that we never would have known, that we never would have looked into if we hadn't been looking for something else. And that's, kids, why you buy a dictionary. Um, well, it, rumors it, and it, conspiracy it, theories are all based in truths. If the truth is that the mayor of Detroit lives mayor. in the Manugian mansion. He had parties. He had some parties. He had cops do uh, things outside the per- what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, that's true. So you that's put true. those things together. I'm just saying but that's, that's why, how they build. So, right. That's, that's how they why persist. You find real things. Yeah. That's how they persist, and that's why when he says, "I didn't do it," and by the way, I also didn't cheat on my wife. Bang, bang, bang. Well, we find out you did cheat on your wife. Bang, bang, bang. He says, "Yeah, but that one thing I didn't do." It's like, well, when you said you didn't do the others, and it turns out you did do the others. You kind of don't get to walk away from it. I thought his response about the Manugian party was... Ain't no party like a Detroit party. Because a Detroit party don't stop. Oh, or start, <laughs> in this case. But so over time, you know, I can't tell you. In fact, I guarantee you after this show, I'll get emails from people who say, um, you know, well, you know, the, I know one of the cops who was there. I, you know, guess what, folks? Those cops would have come forward because Gary Brown... Especially now. So, yeah. So when Gary Brown gets fired... Finally, the Manugian Mansion Party makes the news because when he's fired, he and his lawyer allege that one of the reasons he was fired and why another bodyguard who worked for the mayor, one of the most, one of the most uh, stand-up guys you'll ever meet, Walt Harris, who also wrote a book um, about his experience working for Kwame Kilpatrick and being a Detroit cop. I highly recommend Walt Harris's book. Um, they said that one of the reasons why their careers were ruined is because they were too close to the truth and because Kwame Kilpatrick was trying to shut them up. So that gave more credence to all of this. Um, ultimately, you know, when the text messages come out, there's no mention of a party. And these guys put everything they ever thought or did into text mess. Everything but city business, by the way. <laughs> but if, if you want to know what was going through their head, these text messaging devices was almost like somebody, a stenographer was taking a transcript of their thoughts. There's no mention of the party. Nobody said anything like, uh, said anything like, um, you know, whoa, things got out of hand, or did you see how hot she was, or when is so-and-so coming over, or, you know, strawberry's dead, it's taken care of, boss, or whatever happens, keep us away from that. Nothing. 
Nothing at all. The closest that it came to that is Carlita Kilpatrick at one time sent a text message to one of her friends years later saying, can you believe what they're saying I did? You know, this is preposterous. The other thing, and I'll take a pause, is people get in trouble and they give people up. That's why when you tell somebody else a secret, it's eventually going to come out, either because somebody wants to share it because they think it's cool, because somebody's got a big mouth, because somebody wants to blow you up, or because somebody thinks it's going to get them off the hook. So many people got in trouble. I guarantee you one of them would have come forward and said, you know what? I can prove the party rumor if you cut me a break on something. And even though that's not a huge crime that somebody uh, would want to give up a bigger charge on, they keep cutting deals for people who say they know where Hoffa is because it's such an amazing thing. The reason why the free press assigned so many of us to look into this is because while I told them it was bullshit, if it turned out it was true, they couldn't miss that story. Yeah. They had to be the ones to break it. So somebody would have got themselves a sweetheart walkaway deal if they could have given proof of the Manugian Mansion party. You also asked me, sorry, I said I was going to take okay. a pause, but I'm just going to plow through for just a second. You asked me if I thought it was appropriate for the Attorney General to investigate. It was appropriate to investigate because... There was an allegation of wrongdoing involving one of the most high-ranking and powerful people in the state of Michigan. Detroit police couldn't be trusted to investigate it because it was clear that Christine Beatty was, was pulling the strings in the Detroit Police Department. Plus, it's tough to investigate your boss. So it was appropriate for a third party to investigate. But one reason why that continued to go on is because Mike Cox, the attorney general at the time, was tight with Mike Duggan, who was the Wayne County prosecutor at the time, who was tight with Kwame Kilpatrick, the mayor of Detroit at the time, and it looked like they handpicked somebody to whitewash this. In addition to that, and by the way, Mike Cox, his investigation confirmed all the reporting Jim Schaefer and I did, um, but at the same time, Mike Cox, when he decided he was going to end the, the investigation, the state police said, we're going to keep investigating. So now you have the state police oh, sending a signal that maybe we didn't get to the bottom of this. They eventually concluded their investigation and said they didn't get to the bottom of it either. But they wanted to subpoena hospital records to run down all those possible leads that this stripper was taken to the hospital. And Mike Cox would not authorize the subpoenas. And so now he becomes part of yep. the conspiracy. And so now his limo company brought the stripper to the Manugian Mansion Party. <laughs> and you can see how this thing becomes just this tumbleweed rolling through the, the desert, getting bigger and bigger until it's so large that when it rolls through Falstaff, Arizona, everyone will be dead except for Wyatt Earp. Now, I wanted your opinion, too, on Epstein, going back to that, oh. and how the media has been covering it. And... You know, they have to call it an alleged suicide because there's no coroner report yet. Right. But doesn't that feed right into the conspiracy? So here's why I hate conspiracies. So many people in this country are so unhappy that they won't believe the truth. That the facts, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. You're not entitled to your own facts. If the facts don't fit their beliefs, there must be something wrong with the facts. And what happens is it's appropriate to say this is an alleged suicide because what we don't want to do is say it's a suicide, then come back and say maybe it's not, and then, then people are like, whoa, now you're changing your story. Listen, folks. Is there another way to say it? It takes time for the truth to come out. What they could say is we're Apparent? investigating Jeffrey Epstein's death, which appears to be a suicide, but how's that different than saying alleged suicide? It's just more words, you know? So, so here's the other thing about, and, and we kind of yeah. touch on this, um, so the guards did a crappy job. The prison did a poor job. Prisons are, are chronically understaffed. They do not always get the greatest employees. In this case, one of the guards wasn't really a guard. guard yeah. It was somebody filling in. And the guards have been working massive amounts of forced overtime, so they may not have been on top of their game. The other thing we have to remember, folks, is that people screw up. And it's not because the Trilateral Commission or the Deep State has given them marching orders. Shit happens you can't trust anything else in the universe but you can trust that shit happens it's incompetence so anyway uh Manugian mansion party didn't happen but but you know what i never close off the possibilities if you are the person who was at the party who can help prove the party please send us an email at ml soul of detroit at gmail.com you can call us at 313 313- 288-9070. That's 313-Butterfield-89070. I am more than happy 
to finally prove this thing if it can be proven. And and you know the to me one of the great ironies is on the on the day that Jim Schaefer and I won the Pulitzer Prize for exposing Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick's text messages, we were contacted by somebody who said, "Great job on the text messages." Now, when are you going to stop covering up the Madugan Mansion party? <laughs> he can't win. So, that's life, folks. Turn off the radio! I won't change my mind on anything, regardless of the facts that are set out before me. I'm dug in, and I'll never change. Ray Nut, Ray Tso, Ray Nut, Ray Tso, Ray Nut Infinity, Ray Tso Infinity Plus One. No. CNN media superstar and son of the late Governor Mario Cuomo of the Empire State. Chris Cuomo has a podcast called Let's Get After It. He's also, <laughs> I didn't know he had a podcast. Oh, yeah. Though, oh, yeah. Lord. And he's well known for being a, a very handsome and fit man on, on CNN. Well, uh, recently somebody got after it, but it was him, and he did not appreciate it. So let's have a quick listen to that, and then Sean Windsor will join us for a great debate. I thought, that, I thought, I thought that's who you were. Oh, no, punk-ass bitches from the right call me Fredo. My name is Chris Cuomo. I'm an anchor on CNN. Oh, you're much... Fredo is from the Godfather. He was a weak brother. Isn't that your And they use it as an Italian aspersion. Any of you Italian? Oh, Are you Italian? I gotta, I gotta it's a fucking insult to your people. It's an insult to your fucking people. It's like the N-word for us. Wow. Is, that, is that a cool fucking thing? You're a much more reasonable guy in person than you seem to be on television. Yeah, but if you want to play, then we'll fucking play. If you've got Why something not? you want to say about what I do on television, then say it. But don't be the fault me. Hey, man. Hey, song. listen. What? what? I don't want any problems. Yeah, you're going to have a big fucking problem. What's the problem? It's a little different on TV. What's don't the fucking insult me like that. I didn't insult you. Yeah, I asked you. You call me Fredo. It's like I call you punk bitch. You like that? You want well, that to be your nickname? I didn't call you that. I you called me Fredo. I you know my name's not fucking Fredo. I thought your name was. You did not think my name was fucking Fredo. Don't be a liar. I thought you want to be a man. Stand, stand up like a man. I'm standing up, man. You want to be a man out here. Then fucking own it. Then own what you said. Hey. Then own what you said. Listen, man. I don't have a problem with you, man. You're going to have a fucking problem. What? What are you going to do about it? I'll fucking ruin your shit. I'll fucking throw you down these stairs like a fucking punk. Please do. Why? So you don't want to Wow, that is uh, that is way more interesting than ever anything I've ever heard him say on TV. <laughs> yeah, that is true, yeah. Or, or on his podcast. If if he did this on a regular basis, I think I would pay a little more attention to Fre- uh, Chris Cuomo. But uh, you know, this is something when you're in the public eye, when you're on the streets, you will have people come up to you and say things that happens on a far too regular basis. That a um, a member of the public will interrupt a live shot or start jumping around in the camera behind you. Uh, Sean, I'm sure when you're at the stadiums, if fans recognize you and they don't like what you've written, I don't, I don't know how that's even possible. But if that happened, um, how do you, you know, how do you respond to that? Uh, is is Chris Cuomo out of line, or does he have somebody who's trying to be a shit stir and he and he puts him rightly in his place? Well, a couple of things. First of all, nobody recognizes me. I mean, you know. <laughs> Unless I'm in an aquarium and they just take me for a beluga whale. Or a but, Clark Gable lookalike contest. Yeah, right. I'm with you, Mike. you, you got to get used to it. You have to be able to take it. Obviously, the, the word, the name Fredo hit a nerve, and he thought it was, um, you know, a stereotype, and kind of a nasty stereotype. And, and so I, there's got to be a way that he can respond to that and say, hey, you know, don't call me Fredo, or hey, and keep this cool. He's get, you know, and if he if he doesn't, then he deserves the the heat he's been taking to me. I I think his response was Marco? totally totally out of line, and mainly because my big problem right now is nobody lets anything go. Like everybody has to be a counter puncher, like the president. Everyone has to fight back. It's like, this guy is a joke. No one's ever hit my hands before. I hit back, and nobody's ever hit my hands before. <laughs> we Remember know that when when Rubio went after Trump, he said, "Nobody hit my hands." You know what this guy's doing. He knows what that guy's doing. Just laugh him off as the for the joke that what the guy is. So to me, the guy who came up to him is a punk ass bitch. It was clearly a setup. It was meant to provoke him. It was meant to it was meant to get that sort of response. And you can see his buddies running video the whole time. So clearly, they set a trap. And Chris Cuomo stepped into it. But, and I have no problem with Chris Cuomo saying, hey, you know what my name isn't Fredo. You know, be a man. You know, admit what you're doing. Admit you're trying to be a smart aleck. But he has got to have the composure so that he can say, I'm going to be on camera. 
I'm going to I'm going to look like I'm uh, like I, I got a thin skin, which clearly he does. I, you know, I've never heard Fredo as a derogatory term for an Italian American. It's not. I have heard it as a derogatory term for the chicken Loser shit kid. brother yeah. in the family, which yeah. his brother is the governor of New York. He obviously feels like being highly compensated by CNN having his own podcast, uh, being able to go to big parties like this on the Hamptons, having a place in Florida, being able to yacht and stuff like having a law degree isn't good enough. I would hate to have that sense of security if I had so many accomplishments. But I do think the guy who went up to him deserved, I, I was going to say, a punch in the face. And clearly, if you see the video, he was waiting for a punch in the face because he takes his sunglasses off yeah. knowing that it's about to come. But I think people who do what this provocateur did are completely out of line. They're itty bitty tiny little men. They're obnoxious jerks. But you got to be ready for it. Yeah, you do. And here's the other thing it's amazing how often I see stories where somebody was trying to set somebody up and they were getting paid to do it. Just so discord, and to Mark's point, this idea of, uh, of fighting and, and counter punching and that we're all so angry, that, that's being stirred up by intent. Wait, so you, you seriously think that the Russians may have put this guy up to this? No, I don't oh. know that. I, 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 I know, know the Chechens I, got you that phone. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I have no idea. I don't know that. Um, I don't know what the New York Times the other day about, about uh, the all rights rise and sweep. And some of this exact kind of thing is going on. My other problem with this, I thought CNN's reaction was a little ludicrous. I expect them to support their talent. That's fine. But, you know, they basically flat out said this is an ethnic slur, which I, I this is the first time it's ever been an ethnic slur to me. I mean, I think other people know the two other slurs for Italians. Uh, so I guess this is the third one now. Michael so, and Sonny. But I'm <laughs> I'm really surprised that CNN didn't point out that this guy was goading him. And, and instead of defending him, they should have put the attack. That's how they should have put the attack on him. Not at that moment. Wait, but, but I thought you were sick of people counterattacking. Well, not the attack, but to point out what is really going on here. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, CNN, frankly, probably should have given him a couple of days off. His language was inappropriate. Yeah. He threatened to throw a guy it's down the a, stairs. It's not a good look for, the, for him. It's not a good look no, for the terrible And he loses. He loses in this. Yeah. So I, I'm going to say that I, I, with tremendous trepidation and great reservation, support Chris Cuomo because I don't like these people who are out there to try and make a fuss and to make a scene like that. But, but boy, I, don't, oh boy. I don't support his reaction, though. I think it's, I think it's insane. He knows, he knows that's going to happen to him. Anybody that's on CNN should know that could happen to him. Anybody that's on Fox should know that, that something like that could happen to him while they're eating at a restaurant and people come in and chant. PBS, you're probably okay. Yeah, because nobody watches Somebody it. Somebody comes up and plays the violin. <laughs> you know. And gives you a tote bag. But yeah. I, I, think, I think he was totally out of line here. And I don't support him. Sean, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think he overreacted. I mean, when you think about, look, and I don't want to compare Cuomo to Obama, but you think about all the all the garbage Obama took and how he never punched back. There are people that can do that. I'm not saying he has to take to, to rise to that level, but people do that in their day in their daily life all the time. That are public figures. Um, maybe not the level Cuomo is, and maybe some that are more, but it's absolutely possible. And I'm with you, Mark. It well, was, uh, with a ridiculous. with a clothes pin. Maybe even a pair of vice grips on my nose. I am going to come down on the side of Chris Cuomo, but I think it's fair to say there's nobody to cheer for in all of this. And by the way, if somebody comes up to me and, and calls me uh, patio furniture, I will throw your ass down a flight of stairs. So keep your nose clean, be polite, and that's a great debate. Oh man, the geeks have inherited the earth. Did I do that? What a dork. Is him wanting to play with us again mean that he's turning into a geek or we're turning into cool guys? I'm a union guy. I'm just going to be upfront about it. Now, I don't defend every union ever. I mean, some of the stuff that's going on at the UAW makes me sick to my stomach. I still think the UAW is a very important union. But <sighs> Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports. Um, and a University of Michigan graduate. Oh, but, two strikes. You're almost out. I thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah. 
in the media, we have a very uncertain future. Things are very tough. Uh, people tend to take things away from us rather than give them to us when we seek remuneration and benefits. And so there's been a move within the media to unionize. And uh, I was a longtime activist in the Detroit Newspaper Guild. I really believe strongly in the News Guild. Well, Dave Portnoy doesn't like that unionization stuff. And there was a guy or a woman who worked for Barstool who had contacted a colleague or had somehow expressed in some sort of written way that uh, they were interested in maybe unionizing. Uh, another guy who has unionized other um, Internet writers reached okay. out to him and said, hey, if any of you Barstool people want to unionize, direct message me. And that's what set Portnoy off. Which is perfectly reasonable because these these, especially these online things, they come and go overnight. In fact, there was a story about a guy who left an online thing to join another online thing, and the other online thing closed a week after mm-hmm. he got out there. Who's protecting his benefits? You know, so unions are a pretty good idea. So then, what did what did old uh, what did old DP do when he found out about this? He tweeted out that he would fire you on the spot. Wow! If so. he found out. Now here's the thing with him. I think he's his own worst enemy because I like Barstool. I don't really like what he does with it. Um, how he built it is amazing, but he, I think, I think with this whole thing, he's really needling everybody by saying that. Well, I love, I love uh, Barstool after the the last Michigan Michigan State game where Winovich was going off, where they posted something yeah. that said, uh, "What's she so mad yeah. about?" Which I thought <laughs> See, was Bar- it's great. Was he's, genius. He can be their own worst enemy, and this is not giving them the kind of publicity I think. They would want, but he always seems to come out on top. Well, we'll see. But I'll just tell you, as somebody who has always been a worker and not a boss, if you want to get 100% from me, don't threaten me. Don't try and restrict my rights. And don't tell me some other shit that I don't want to hear. I don't know. Where Amen. was I going with that? Amen. There we go. That's the gospel. But no, Dave Portnoy, tough guy with the Twitter. Hmm. Where have we seen that before? For coming down hard on on the little guy, you are our Geek of the Week. love to hear from listeners and uh maybe to our surprise i'm not sure um uh room 7609 is turning out to be one of the more popular features of of ml soul detroit perhaps because it's the four or five minutes where one of us isn't talking but (laughs) but, uh that's that's a hurtful and and mean mean thought yeah but you said it well i'm yeah Maybe I should have stopped talking a long time ago. Anyways, we like uh, it when people do our job for us, like this. Uh, oh yeah, mailer. Yes, that's right. All all hands uh, make for a light load. In fact, uh, solidarity. Right? There's a union message right Amen. there, Mr. Portnoy. Yeah, there you go. Portnoy's complaint. Oh, my workers care. My workers want to be protected. I'll pull the bar stool right out of you, little. Pe- okay, sorry. Uh, different segment. Different segment. Um, reader or listener Dave writes in. Love the love and rockets, which was featured on last week's. Uh, Soul of Detroit. If you missed last week's episode, go to mlsoulofdetroit.com. Go to wherever you find your podcast and listen to it. It was a peach. Best one yet, Mark says. Always. Uh, Dave loves the show, and he says, how about the mission of Burma? That's when I reach for my revolver. Keep up the great work. Now, at first I thought he said, he was saying, when I hear mission of Burma, I reach for my revolver because I hate these guys. No, it turns out it's a song, so let's listen together, shall we? Here's the mission of Burma with... That's when I reach for my revolver. Once I had my heroes, once I had my dream, but all of that is
that's the response we get from a lot of listeners. They said, when the ML Soul of Detroit, because I subscribe, comes up on Lex, that's when I reach for my revolver, which uh, I, I used to take as a hateful thing. But now I realize they're just fans of the mission of Burma, like, like Mr. D. Uh, what do you think, Mark? I really like it. And uh, doing a little bit of research here, the singer and guitarist, born and raised in? Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan. There you go. Yeah, a Boston band. And they, they, they had one album. They broke up because... The guitarist, Roger Miller, guy from Ann Arbor, had tinnitus. That's the ringing of the ears that yeah. makes it kind of tough to uh, like yeah, hear so stuff. What could have been with them? But that song's been covered a few times as well. So, no, I, pretty solid, man. Yeah, it's so I, I'm sure we're going to get some people saying, you know. Um, it's more punky. It's punky. Where's That's the what I like synth? Where's the whatever? And And to me, New Wave encompasses that transition from dinosaur rock from Crosby, Stills, and Nash, from, uh, from hardcore and punk and, and goth into a more melodic, a more, um, I, I don't want, God, I don't want to say easy listening, but something, <laughs> something that's a little less uh, abrasive, maybe a little, less, um, a little less driving than what came before it. These guys, it sounds like, started in the early 80s, so they would have been sort of on the beginning of the new wave. Um, I like that tune. I'm kind of curious where they could have gone with it because you see the evolution. We've talked about this before, and one of these days we're going to have to do a little ministry on 7609. But when ministry, which is, if you've ever heard Stigmata, that is a driving, hardcore, just really edgy tune. They started out as kind of a really you know, hippy dippy poppy band, and so the evolution of these groups wow. can be... Uh, can be amazing. Some of them start awesome, like the Smiths or Duran Duran, and just stay awesome. But uh, there is an evolution. And I'm sorry that uh, a physical disability held back a mission to Burma, but uh, appreciate a chance to listen to them. And if you have something you'd like us to play, uh, maybe you want to introduce us to something, because Room 7609 is about introducing you to bands that you never heard of, but you maybe should have, or hits, or, or I should say songs that weren't hits for bands that you know, it's all about expanding your musical uh, yeah. knowledge, and uh, today ours was expanded, so thank you very much. We look forward to hearing back from you uh, all the time. Um, going to the mailbag, how do you reach us? Well, mlsoulofdetroit at gmail.com. You can call us at Butterfield 89070. Of course, that's in the 313. Andrew writes in, guys, my, son and, my wife and two sons, age 9 and 7, have a tradition that during the school year we have retro mu- movie night on Friday nights after we all get home. This has allowed us to introduce the boys to classics, including the Karate Kid movies, Back to the Future 1 through 3, and the Rocky musics, uh, movies. Sorry, not much sleep last night. <laughs> In thinking about movies for this year, I told my wife that I wanted to introduce them to one of my favorites as a kid, Flight of the Navigator. She wasn't sure if it was age-appropriate, so I took the time to rewatch it myself. There's a scene in the movie where the main character, David, sees a music video for the first time after being missing the years 1978 to 1986. The scene also includes a young Sarah Jessica Parker. Huh. The music video is for the song Lose Your Love by Black Mange. It is a pretty strange video, which would be even strange if you'd never seen a music video video before. Okay, we will check that out. I, uh, I've heard of Black Mange before, Black Mange. I don't know. It depends which part of France you're from. Uh, we're on it. We're going to check it out. That's, uh, that's kind of cool they do that retro movie night. It just made me think of like two movies that stick out in my head from back in the day that I remember my parents having or watching with us. One is Pee-wee's Big Adventure, which quite possibly one of the best movies ever made in the history of cinema. Ah! Yeah, it's and great. the other one is, I remember my parents, and looking back now, I might have been too young for this because I was about seven or eight, National Lampoon's Vacation. Maybe they just wanted to make you feel better about your family? <laughs> yeah, see, our vacations aren't that bad. Look at this one. Uh, my, I love that movie. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for exposing me to... Movies that I was probably too young for. When I was growing up, my mom took my brother and I to see Tommy at the theater. Oh, really? Wow. Which was, I think, the beginning of my fascination with Anne Margaret. <laughs> and let me tell you, uh, a woman rolling around in beans and chocolate has never looked so good. <laughs> I do remember, too, my mom got very upset when she found out that my brother's friend took us to go see Coming to America. Oh. When that came out in the theaters, because I must have been, I don't know, 13, 12 or 13. Doesn't well, seem it. like that edgy of a flick, but... Uh, well, yeah, maybe. There's nudity in it. We're talking about the Eddie Murphy one, yeah. not something you'd find on porn. No, 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 no. Okay, no. okay. No, coming, C-O-M-I-N-G. Okay, okay, good. 
damn creep. okay um uh brian <laughs> uh writes in uh ml fan of the podcast and all of your reporting on kwame uh, that's mr kilpatrick to you the reason i'm writing is to ask if you ever make any speaking engagements I'm a member of the Lapeer Optimist, and we meet every Thursday at noon for lunch and about a 20 to 30-minute guest speaker. I do try and get out as much as I can. I especially try to get out into the Detroit public schools so that I can reach out to kids um, who I think uh, really need to engage with people. And who I'm frankly, I'm just trying to assess what the state of the schools are. Um, I do do some charity appearances and things like that, so I will try and follow up with you, Brian. We always want to hear from you here at the Soul of Detroit. Please write us. Uh, please rate us. You can rate us on uh, on iTunes or any other of the podcasting hosting formats. Um, I was looking at some of the reviews. One of our, our very gracious and kind reviewers asked for an update on my nephew, oh, Abraham yeah. the Hammer. He's doing great. Uh, he's making his weight. He's getting ready to start walking. He's he's raising cane. If you didn't hear about his ordeal. I think it's episode two or three of the podcast. Yeah, so, the so go back How old is he and, now? and check it out. He's coming up on his first birthday. Oh boy! So that's uh, great. So I remember where we were a year ago. And if people don't believe in miracles, and you might not like the University of Michigan, uh, let me tell you something. That hospital there, uh, I'm the biggest fan they got. So, uh, so they're not all bad there in Ann Arbor. It's really just Sean Windsor. No, I think we're all really good. No. Really bad. Well, some people, yeah. Of course, you guys. To, of wanna, course, you guys think you're good. That's the problem. I do want to point out. This is how ML needles me. We went to the soccer game Uh-oh. on Saturday for football. Uh, football Barca's game. Soccer. Saw it at the pitch. Uh, know your audience. It's soccer. Um, <laughs> so we, I mean, we had to walk around the whole stadium to get replaced. It's a long story. And I said to Emma, I said, I just wanted to make you walk around this beautiful stadium. And what did you say? Oh, no, I love the stadium. I love the city. Yeah. And I got mad at you. Yost because, is my favorite hockey oh, venue you're just, you're doing uh, it again. of all times. You're doing it again. You, you, anytime I try to needle you with it, you're like, no, all that stuff's great. It's not that bad. But do you remember what I asked the elevator uh, attendant when we got to the top? No. I asked her where the crying room was. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out there isn't one, but I'll tell you see, what. You give it out, but when I try to put it on you, no, no, no I love all of it. When the, Spartans, oh. when the Spartans get there this year, there will be much. When are you going to act more like Cuomo? Much crying. Uh, I'll push you down the stairs. <laughs> Actually, with, with the stairs here at the Red Shovel Network, yeah, there's, a, need a push. there's a real danger of falling down, but, but they're so narrow, you'd get wedged on the way. So you'd, <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. You'd, you'd walk away. Uh, you'd be a you'd pile of away. bodies and stuck on that stairwell. Do, do we have time for a, a quick little story? Or? No, but go ahead. Okay. So uh, a buddy of mine, uh, speaking of people falling down the stairs, claims that he had heard that the uh, – remember the, the fat guys on bicycles, on mini bikes in the – Guinness Book of World yeah. Records oh, with yeah. the cowboy hats. The twins. Mm-hmm. Right. That Larry Flint at one time offered one of them money <laughs> oh, to no. do a photo shoot. And at the time, he was in his little upstairs, you know, attic office in Ohio. Yeah. And, um, and so the, one of the twins agreed to do it. And they were trying to get him up the stairs, and he got wedged. What? And so they had to butter him to get him back down the stairs. So he never made it all the way up, but they had to grease that pig to get him out of there. Now, so that's a crazy story. Again, this may be a a rumor. It's got to be a rumor. So here's how small the world is. One of my very good friends, it turns out her mother worked as a secretary for Larry Flint at Hustler. And so I said to her, have you ever heard the story about the Guinness Book of World Records fat guy who they had to grease? And she said, Never heard it. So oh, okay. It may be apocryphal. Yeah, I like to think Larry would have thought a little bit ahead of time and go, he can't make it up. Hey, man, on the stairs. Get, 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 get some land of lakes on the road. I like it, though. Get the Ponderosa. That's a conspiracy theory I am going to believe because I want it to be true. And that's what happens with cons- Thank you for bringing us full circle. Conspiracies <laughs> exist because we want them to, to believe them. By the way, I was at the JFK uh, Dealey Plaza Museum after seeing how JFK came around that turn, I believe Oswald acted alone. Anyway, we appreciate you listening here to ML Soul of Detroit. Please listen to all the Red Shovel shows. That's uh, Eli, Denny, and Bob with No Filter Sports, Charlie Duff's No BS News Hour, and, of course, our flagship, the Drew and Mike podcast. Listen to us, rate us, share us, subscribe. You have been listening to ML Soul of Detroit on the Red Shovel Network. Cyrus, take us out. Can you dig that? Can you dig it? Can you dig it? Next week. 
Escape with us to East English Village. And the story of a futile attempt to save M.L. Elric from the clutches of the most cold-blooded political organization on Earth as Mark Fellhauer tells it in his exciting story, A Bullet for Sean Windsor. <laughs>